which are not useful for the strongly connected components. Um, and there are some singleton strongly connected components here. Okay, so I hope the, the model is clear. So what I want to do is start by giving just a quick recap of the undirected case, which is of course the usual Erdős-Rényi random graph GNP. So in that setting, each of the entries two possible undirected edges is present independently with probability P. And that model famously undergoes a phase transition, which I'm just going to remind you of briefly here. So suppose that we take the probability that a particular edge is present to be like C on N plus maybe an error, which is little of N to the minus one, as N goes to infinity for some fixed constant C greater than or equal to zero. So then if that constant is less than one, the components are all microscopic in size. And if the constant is bigger than one, there's a unique giant component, a component occupying a positive proportion of the vertices and all of the others are microscopic in size. And of course, the most interesting things occur at the point of the phase transition. So if I take my P to be one on N, and indeed I can take something a little bit away from that. So if I add um, a, a sort of jiggle away from one on N, which is lambda N to the minus four thirds for some real value lambda, then in this regime, the largest component is on the order of N to the two thirds. And indeed there's a whole sequence of components on the same order. And this parameter lambda is a, uh, gives us the so-called critical window. Okay, so the digraph model DNP undergoes, if you like, the same phase transition. So this is a result due to Karp and Wuchak from 1990. So if I take again my, my probability P to be C on N plus potentially something little of N to the minus one, then if C is less than one, all of the strongly connected components are microscopic in size. And if C is bigger than one, then there's a unique strongly connected component of size big O of n, so a giant component, and all of the others are again microscopic in size. So, so far so similar to GNP. But this is really a bit of a false analogy, not least because there are roughly twice as many edges present in my digraph model. Right? I've got about twice as many possibilities and so therefore uh, potentially twice as many edges present. So we should rather be thinking about the emergence of the first cycles in GNP as a better analogy. And that is also something which occurs in the critical window. So let me just remind you of some facts about the critical components of the odish renyi random graph. So in, back in GNP, in the undirected case, if I take my probability to be one on N plus lambda N to the minus four thirds for some fixed lambda, then the largest components are on the order of n to the two thirds and the typical distance between a pair of points in such a component is on the order of n to the one third. So we see this kind of classic scaling relationship which you see for example in a uniform random tree where the size of the object um, is say some m and the distances are looking like the square root of m. Okay so here we've got sizes on the order of n to the two thirds and typical distances on the order of n to the one third. And there are order one cycles in such a component. Okay, so a tight number of cycles. And indeed those cycles, if there are any, have lengths on the order of n to the one third. So on the order of the typical distance. Okay. And it turns out that we see something similar in the critical version of the directed graph. So this is rather a full slide. So let me take you through it slowly. So this is a, a, a more refined theorem due to Wuchak and Seierstad from 2009. So this uh, places us at p equals one on n, so at the critical point, plus now epsilon n on n to the fourth thirds. So if I were working by analogy with GNP, what I would want to put here would be epsilon n to be a constant lambda. And which I can say I don't quite do that. What they do is they take epsilon n to be something which is diverging to infinity or to minus infinity, but at smaller rate than n to the one third. And what they show is that if epsilon is going to plus infinity, so this is, if you like, you should think about this as sort of heading towards the barely supercritical regime. Then what you see is a largest strongly connected component on the size of size about four times epsilon squared n to the one third, and a second largest, which is n to the one third on epsilon n. And if epsilon n on the other hand is going towards the bottom, so to minus infinity, then the largest strongly connected component has size n to the third on modulus of epsilon n. 
So I don't expect you to be able to take all this in and, and sort of interpret what it means, but let's imagine that we were allowed to put lambda a constant, so epsilon n equals to lambda a constant into this theorem, then what we would be seeing here would be a largest component on the order of n to the one third and a second largest component on the order of n to the one third also. Okay, and indeed it turns out that that's what's the case. So we're going to concentrate on the critical window. Um, and we should be seeing something like critical components on the order of n to the one third. So there's a strong piece of evidence in this direction from Matthew Coulson in 2019, who showed that the size of the largest strongly connected component was tight when rescaled by n to the minus a third. And we go further than that and prove a scaling limit. So on rescaling the ordered sequence of strongly connected components by n to the minus one third, we obtain a continuum limit object. And the rest of my talk, I hope to explain how that works. So I want to start with some terminology. Since I'm going to be rescaling, I'm going to need some sort of continuum notion of a directed graph or indeed a directed multigraph. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So a directed multigraph is a triple for us, a vertex set, an edge set, and a function R, which is going to tell us the relation between the two. So R has two components, R1 and R2. And is a function from the edge set into the vertex set times the vertex set. So this is going to give us the relationship between the vertices and edges as follows. So R1 of E is the tail of a directed edge E and R2 of E is its head. So here the vertex U and the vertex V have two directed edges which join them. Um, and for each of those directed edges E and F we have that R1 of E is U, R2 of E is V and similarly for F. So this allows us to deal with the problem of multiple edges relatively straightforwardly. Okay, so the case where uh, V is just the vertex, so where the vertex set is a singleton V and the edge set is also a singleton and where both the head and the tail of the uh, edge E are given by V, this is just called a loop and it's going to play a particular role uh, in the rest of the talk. So we need one little bit more structure here. So we've got our directed multigraph V E R and we want to add to it a function L. So this is a function from the edge set uh, into the positive reals. And this is just going to assign each edge of my directed multigraph a length. Um, and so the thing that's going to play a particular role is the degenerate case of a loop of length zero, which I'm going to denote by this script L here. And that's gonna play a special role. So one thing that's easy to see is that the notion of strong connectivity carries over straightforwardly to these settings. The lengths don't affect strong connectivity at all. And the fact that we have multiple edges or loops, again, doesn't affect the strong connectivity. Okay, so let me take the strongly connected components of my digraph, whatever they might be, and let's list them for definiteness in decreasing order of size, breaking ties in an arbitrary manner. I'm going to think of this as a sequence of MDM, so metric directed multigraphs, by just thinking of a maximal length or a maximal length path of degree two vertices, such as this, as being a single directed edge of length K, which is just between its endpoints. Okay, so I'm going to contract this object to give me the object on the right hand side, where these numbers here are giving me the lengths of these directed edges. And those are just the number of hops that I need to. Um, so the number of edges that I need to traverse to get between the endpoints. And if I have a, a cycle like this, a directed cycle, then I'm going to contract it to a loop and that requires me to keep one vertex. So this is just an arbitrary one of these vertices and now a loop of length five. So I hope that that contraction is clear. So then our main result is as follows. So if I take that ordered list of connected, strongly connected components, with the, the contraction that I just described in order to make them into MDMs. And then I'm going to complete the list just with an, inf an infinite sequence of copies of my loop of length zero. So then the result is that if we place ourselves in what ought to be the critical window here, then there exists a sequence of random strongly connected metric directed multigraphs such that each of those components CI is either three regular or a loop and such that on rescaling the sizes of our, um, or indeed the distances in our strongly connected components uh, by n to the one third, we get convergence in distribution. Um, so 
I haven't really told you what I mean by uh, convergence in this setting, so that's the first thing I'm going to do in a moment. But before I do, let me just make a comment um, about the three regular or loop thing. So what do I mean by three regular? I mean that each vertex of one of these limit objects here either has, well, either it's a loop, or if it has a more complex structure, then a vertex has two in edges and one out edge, or uh, one in edge and two out edges. And those are the only possibilities that might occur. Okay, so I owe you an explanation of what it means for two MDMs to be close to one another. And I also owe you an explanation of what the limit object is. Okay, so what's the sense of this convergence first? So suppose for the moment, I've just got two metric directed multigraphs. So I've got my vertex at my edge set, the relation between them and then the lengths, and then similarly for X primed. So I'm going to let isom X, X primed just be the set of graph isomorphisms from X to X primed. So the easiest way for us to describe that is as a pair of bijections, one between the vertex sets and another between the edge sets, and such that these respect one another and the structure of the graph. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if I've got edge E on the left-hand side and I map it through the edge bijection, and then I look at its head and tail, that gives me the same as I would have got by first taking the head or sorry, first taking the tail of the edge E, mapping it through the vertex bijection, and then looking at where that goes to. So, so if I do these things in the different orders, I get the same thing. So here's an example of um, a particular isomorphism between, so the graph on the left and the graph on the right, which are of course the same. So because I have this multiple edge here, I have two choices about which edge I'm going to map E2 into. Well, I choose here to map it into E3 primed. Okay, so there are two possible isomorphisms in this picture. Okay, and everything else has to map in the sensible way. So I hope it's clear what I mean by this. I, I can't see anybody, so um, maybe if somebody could sell, tell me in the chat if it's unclear. Um, otherwise I'll move on. Okay. So I've got a notion of isomorphism between two of these metric directed multigraphs, which of course doesn't take any account of the lengths. This is just thinking about the graph structure. So now I'm going to declare the distance between X and X primed to be, so take the infimum over isomorphisms between X and X primed, so infimum over these graph isomorphisms. And then what I'm gonna ask to look at is the supremum of the difference in length between some edges in the, the graphs that I'm looking at. Okay, so if E is an edge that maps to G of E, then I want to compare the lengths of those two things. And my aim is to make the biggest difference between edge lengths as small as I can. Okay, so I'm trying to match things up in such a way that the edge lengths are as, as, as similar as I can. Okay, so notice that this is quite a strong notion of distance here, if this set of isomorphisms is empty, then I'm just going to set X and X prime to be an infinite distance one another. So I really am requiring that the graph structure be exactly the same. And the setting that I'm really interested in has sequences of these MDMs. Okay, so if I've got two sequences of MDMs listed in decreasing order of total length, then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the distance between these two to be the sum of the distances between the coordinates. Okay, so that's the sense of the convergence in this theorem here. And in particular, um, a consequence of this theorem is that the limit object has finite total length. So this is in contrast to the sort of things that we're, interest, uh, that we're used to seeing in the context of the Odishrini random graph where the limit object is a rather complicated sort of uh, sequence of random fractals, which certainly don't have finite total length. Okay, so what should you have in mind as a picture of this limit object? So really what we've got is a collection of directed cycles which are sort of glued onto one another, which have sort of real valued lengths. Um, but we're getting convergence in this sense that, so sort of a large enough end, you can really match up the graph structures and the lengths are approximately right. Um, and beyond a certain point, all we're seeing is loops. Okay. So, um, anybody who's seen me talk about this sort of topic before won't be surprised to learn that there's uh, an algorithm sitting under the way that we construct these things. 
And indeed, there are several linear time algorithms for finding the strongly connected components of a digraph. And I'm going to use a variant of Tarjan's algorithm in this talk, but there are potentially other ways you might do it. So let me just start with D, which is an arbitrary digraph with vertices labeled by the integers one up to n. And the first thing I'm going to do is extract from that digraph a directed forest which spans the vertices. Okay, so here's my digraph um, drawn, I hope, in a sort of reasonably suggestive manner. And what I'm going to do is a sort of depth first exploration of this thing. So I'm going to start from the lowest labeled vertex. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to explore its out neighborhood. So those are the vertices five and 17. So reveal the out neighbors and I'm going to move to the lowest labeled of them. And I'm going to keep a hold of a stack of vertices which I've seen but not yet explored. So uh, that's for the moment the vertex 17. Okay, so I'm now going to explore the out neighborhood. So that's in this context two. Um, I've still got 17 sitting on a stack of things that I've seen but not yet explored. Um, and two, when I look at its out neighborhood, I haven't, there aren't any vertices that I haven't already discovered. So 17 is something I already know about. And so in particular, two has no new out neighbors. Okay, so I don't think if I ignore this directed edge here, it's not giving me a sort of child relationship in the, in the forest that I'm trying to pick out. Um, and I'm just effectively going to think that two has no children and move to the vertex sitting on the top of the stack, which is 17. Okay, and again, 17 has no new out neighbors. And so I leave it at that. And the rule now for what you do in this context when the stack gets empty is to just move to the next lowest labeled vertex that you haven't yet explored. And that's three here. Okay, so you can see that I've picked out a directed tree here, which is encompassing these four vertices. And I'm going to continue in the same way. So I explore the out neighborhood of three. So that's the vertices eight, 10, and 15 here. 10 and 15 go on the stack. Um, and I explore in my depth first manner up from eight. Okay, so I hope it's reasonably clear how this works. So I'm just one by one exploring and picking out in red a forest. Okay, so I'm going to let FD be the directed forest on the vertices one up to N, which I've picked out by this depth first exploration. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is that this procedure gives us a, a nice ordering of the vertices and it has the property that the edges here are increasing for that ordering. Okay, so I'm gonna think of this as providing us a sort of planar ordering of the forest. So my original object didn't have a planar embedding but I'm going to use uh, this ordering here to give me one. Okay, and then this enables us to divide into three parts the edges of my digraph. So I've picked out in red the edges of the forest that I just discovered. So those are all increasing for this planar ordering. The orange edges are all of the other edges which are increasing for the planar ordering, but not edges of the forest. So we saw one of those in the uh, exploration of our very first tree, which is from V2 to V3. So there's just a question in the chat from Nathaniel. It is together a breadth, depth and breadth search um, not really. Uh, just, just because, uh, 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 yes, uh, 17, you could have, uh, 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 let me go back to, yeah, yes, uh, because you, you, you chose, uh, to, to look at, uh, f f uh five and 17 together. Ah, oh, I didn't really. So what, what do I mean by look at? So I mean, I'm aware of the existence of 17, but I haven't yet explored its neighborhood. So Be, that's why for me it's on the stack. Yes, but you, you, could, you, you could have gone from one to five and then five to two and then two to 17 if uh, 17 had, had been free. Right. OK, so when I explore one, my what I do is I say, well, I'm going to look at its neighborhood and I'm going to become aware of who its neighbors are. OK, so at that point, oh, OK, what yeah, I mean yeah. by exploring a vertex is just revealing its out neighbors. Uh, yes, all the neighbors, it, it, all it, of the out neighbors of, 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 of words I, I was saying, but uh, it, you, you could what? Oh, OK, I, th I, 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 I think we both know what we mean and we're sort of quibbling about yeah. definitions. Yeah. OK, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Nathaniel. I hope it's clear. Okay, so, so we've got three sorts of edges. So I, I 
with my sort of uh, particular choice of exploration, I'm going to think of this one as surplus. So this is not an edge of the tree, but it is nonetheless increasing for the ordering. Um, and then there are the blue edges, which are decreasing for the planar ordering. And I'm going to think of those as back edges because they go backwards for this ordering. Okay, so um, this decomposition into three parts turns out to be very useful. So let me just show you what the strongly connected components are. So this was in fact the example I had at the start. Um, so you can see that here's, uh, this tree in fact ends up being a, a, a single strongly connected component here. Um, and we've got various other strongly connected components sitting inside this tree. But there are a whole bunch of edges which aren't actually playing an important role from the perspective of the strongly connected components. So if I were to remove the edges that I've just removed, that still gives me the same strongly connected components. Okay, so let me make some observations. So any non-singleton strongly connected component must contain at least one forward edge and one back edge, otherwise there's no way of making a loop. Um, each strongly connected component therefore is contained within a single tree of the directed forest, since there are no forward edges between different trees. So even if I can get from one tree to another via a backward edge, I can't make the reverse journey. Okay, so each strongly connected component is contained within a single one of these trees. On the other hand, one such tree can contain multiple strongly connected components. So here's an example. We had this middle tree here it contains lots of strongly connected components. Um, and importantly, that given the directed spanning forest, so these surplus edges, these orange ones, can go from a vertex VJ to any vertex which is sitting on the stack at the time when I explore VJ. So that's precisely what happened here. Uh, V3 was sitting on the stack when I explored V2, and so this edge is surplus. Um, and the back edges, on the other hand, can go from a vertex VJ to any lower labeled vertex. So to VI for any I which is strictly less than J. Okay, so in order to find the strongly connected components, it's important to note that firstly, not all back edges matter. Okay, so in particular, if you look here, I've actually deleted quite a lot of them when it came to revealing the strongly connected components. Okay, so a particularly important role is played by back edges, which we refer to as ancestral. So those are, uh, backages which point to an ancestor in this forest. So let's just take a single tree in my directed forest and let's assume for simplicity that there aren't any surplus edges because they complicate matters. Um, so if there are only non-ancestral backages, then there are no non-trivial strongly connected components coming from the tree. So why is that? Suppose we have this situation here. So we have, this is a non-ancestral backage. It's going from V8 to something which is not one of V8's ancestors then there's no way to form a directed cycle, including this edge. Okay, so indeed in this picture, the strongly connected components are simply, simply the singletons given by the individual vertices. Okay, so on the other hand, as soon as there's one ancestral back edge, we have a non-trivial strongly connected component. So here you can see that these three vertices are now forming a directed triangle. And once such an ancestral back edge is present, other non-ancestral back edges can kind of piggyback off it. So here's an example of a non-ancestral back edge, okay, which is sort of making use of the fact that we've got a little strongly connected component here in order to add on this bit of a cycle here. Okay. So what about these surplus edges? So we said that they go from a vertex to something that was sitting on the stack at the time it was explored. And indeed the consequence of that is that the surplus edges are going from a vertex to a younger sibling of one of its ancestors. So here V1 is an ancestor of V6 and V7 is one of its younger siblings. So what I mean by that is further right in the planar ordering. Okay, so there are circumstances where such a surplus edge can help to create a directed cycle. So here's an example of one. So if there happens to be a back edge into a strongly connected part from the subtree which is rooted at the head of this surplus edge, then we get that this part here gets included in a strongly connected uh, component. Okay, so they can intervene, but it takes a couple of different things to conspire in order for that to be the case. So what I'm going to do is using these ideas, perform a second exploration of the forest in the same ordering that I explored the first time. And now I'm going to keep track of an active set of vertices. 
And that active set of vertices is essentially going to be the set of places that I can create a useful back edge to. So something that's going to help me create a strongly connected component. And that's going to allow me to create a list of back edges that really matter. OK, so um, I'm going to start again with my, my single tree. OK, so at step zero, I'm going to start by exploring V0. OK, the active set for the moment is just empty. OK, so I explore the, the, the vertex V1 now. So my active set is going to be the vertex V0. So that's because if I were to have an edge from here to here, that would create a strongly connected component. And as I continue the exploration, the active set tends to grow a little bit. OK, so here I would have interesting vertices potentially to V0 or V1 and so on and so forth. Here it happens that I do get uh, an, uh, uh, an ancestral back edge. So this is a, an edge into the active set. And the active set is now V1, so V0, V1, V2. V4, I could have interesting back edges to any of these vertices here. But on the other hand, when I leave the subtree, which is rooted at V4, it's no longer possible for me to have anything interesting occurring with V4. And so then I output V4 simply as a singleton strongly connected component. And the same is true once I leave the subtree rooted at V5, which is just a singleton V5. I, nothing interesting can now occur involving V5. Okay. V6, I explore. I happen to see a back edge, or a back edge into the active set. Okay, and that adds V6 now temporarily into the active set, except that the next thing I'm going to do is go to V7 and I've left the uh, subtree rooted at V1 and so I can no longer make interesting connections into this part because of this edge which is pointing in the wrong direction for me. So I output a strongly connected component on V1, V2, V3 and V6. So that's this little object here. Okay, and we continue in the same way, each time keeping track of an active set of vertices, which is now just reduced to the vertex V0, to which I might have interesting back edges. Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, so assuming that there are no surplus edges, the only back edges which count are those which go from the current vertex of some step I to whatever my current active set is. And if there are surplus edges, we need to take them to account in a similar way in the definition of the active set, but I'm not going to go there because it turns out that it won't make any difference to me at the end of the day. So now let me come to the random setting that um, is, involves my, my model, uh, which I started with. So in that context, I have that each possible directed edge is present independently with probability P. And that has the consequence that the distribution of this directed forest that I just picked out is actually exactly the same as it would be if I did the same exploration on the Erdős-Rényi random graph in the undirected case. So why is that? At each step, what am I doing? I'm sitting at a vertex. I've got some set of already explored vertices, which I'm going to ignore. And to each of the other vertices in the graph, I simply flip a coin and ask, is that edge, which in this sense I'm thinking of as directed, is the edge present or not? Okay, and that's exactly what I would do in a similar exploration of the Erdős-Rényi random graph. I would just ask, is the now undirected edge present or absent? And that's just a coin flip again with probability P. So in particular, this directed forest is something which is well understood. I'll talk about that in the next few slides, but that's a, a piece of knowledge that we can sort of input into, into our analysis. And then the possible surplus or back edges are each just present independently with probability P. Okay, so let me uh, just talk through how this analysis of the directed forest goes. This really dates back to Aldous in 1997. Um, he was working breadth first rather than depth first, but distributionally it's the same. So in the first exploration, let me just keep track of the size of the stack. And Sn of i is going to be the size of the stack at the time when we explore vertex vi. Okay, so this turns out to evolve essentially like a reflected random walk. So the, the sort of Distribution, or distribution of the steps is as follows. So if I'm if I stack size is currently Sn of i, then its size at time i plus one is going to be given by, so the current stack size plus a binomial random variable minus one. And the parameters of this binomial come about because there were n vertices to start with. I've already looked at i plus one of them 
and there are another SN of I sitting on the stack. And for all of the other remaining vertices, I potentially have a directed edge to that vertex with probability P. And so I get a binomial number of neighbors. And then I have to account for the fact that I've just taken something off the stack and that gives me a minus one. And then this max with zero is just giving me a reflection. So whenever I try to make a step to minus one, that corresponds to completing the exploration of a, a component. And I want to now uh, move back to zero, which corresponds to just starting the exploration of a new tree. Okay, so this is how that process evolves. And since P is about one on N, or one on N plus lambda on N to the minus fourth, uh, N to the four thirds, this is approximately a Poisson random variable. So this binomial can be well approximated by a Poisson with this parameter. And you can see this is roughly Poisson one, and I'm going to subtract off one. So at least if I sort of ignore these bits here, which ought to be disappearing as n goes to infinity, this is essentially looking like a uh, zero mean random walk. So its step sizes are approximately Poisson one minus one. And so it should hopefully be believable that to first order, it's behaving like a centered finite variance random walk reflected at zero. And so in particular, we expect it to have displacement on the order of square root of m at time m. So if I look on the time scale of n to the two thirds, I'm expecting to have moved a distance of about n to the one third. And so that tells me that this third term here in the Poisson parameter is in fact negligible, negligible compared to the other two. So this is on the order of n to the two thirds divided by n. And this is also on the same order, lambda on n to the one third, and this is smaller. So let me discard this. And that tells me that what I'm looking at at time t into the two thirds is an increment which is approximately Poisson one plus lambda minus t n to the minus a third. And then of course there's this minus one. And so it follows that this process here has a scaling limit. If I look in the time scale of n to the two thirds and I rescale space in the usual Brownian scaling by n to the minus one third, and what I get in the limit is this process here, which is a Brownian motion, which has instantaneous drift lambda minus t. So when I integrate that gives me lambda t minus t squared on two, reflected at its running in FEMA. So that's what this reflection here is doing. So that's a process that looks something like this. So I've got a Brownian motion with a parabolic drift. So the drift is, is becoming more and more negative as t gets large. And so that corresponds to getting smaller and smaller in the stochastic sense excursions as I go further rightward. Okay, so why should one be interested in the stack size process? Well, the lengths of its excursions above zero correspond to the sizes of the components in this forest. If I, and if I list them in decreasing order of size, just for definiteness, then I get convergence and distribution as follows. So if I take the component sizes of my trees in this forest and I rescale by n to the two thirds, I get convergence and distribution to the ranked lengths of the excursions above zero of this reflected drifting Brownian motion. Okay, so Remember that SN was the size of the stack when I explore vertex VI. So if I want to really understand the geometry of these trees, that's not such a useful quantity. And I'm rather interested in the distance of the vertex from the root of the subtree that we're, we're currently exploring. So let's, H, let's let HNI be the distance of VI from the root of whatever the subtree we're sitting in is. So then it turns out that SN and HN have the same excursions above zero. And indeed that on the scale that we're interested in, HN is very similar to two times SN. Okay, so the stack size process, so how many vertices there are currently sitting on the stack and my distance from zero are up to a constant factor two, the same thing. And so in particular, we can do use, I'm, I'm doing this in a very sketchy manner and I apologize um, for, for not doing this rigorously. But what we get is that this height process, as it's known, this thing which tracks how far we are from the, vert from the root of the current tree that we're exploring, this also converges in distribution to this reflected drifting Brownian motion just with an extra factor of two here now. Okay. And each excursion of HN above zero encodes a tree. And then the convergence on rescaling of this height process yields the convergence of those trees on rescaling to a collection of our trees. So I'm sure 
everybody in the room has seen this before, but let me just do it quickly. So here's my kind of um, caricature excursion. And I obtain an artery from it essentially by doing the mathematical equivalent of putting glue under the underside of this function and then squishing both sides of the function together. So that's just briefly how we get an artery from a continuous excursion. So I've got a whole sequence of these excursions, indeed not really a sequence, I can't, um, but uh, say on a compact time interval, I can think about ordering them in decreasing order of size and thinking about doing this operation to each of the excursions in order. And what we get is something that looks very like the, the Brownian continuum random tree. So this is the, the picture that Igor already showed us the other day. Um, so we're not getting exactly Brownian CRTs in this particular setting, but it turns out that we're getting something rather similar. So what we're getting here then is joint convergence of the sizes of the trees in this forest on rescaling to the ordered excursion lengths above zero of this reflected drifting Brownian motion. And in terms of the actual trees in the forest themselves, they're also converging um, in distribution to um, uh, a sequence of uh, so continuum trees, so R trees, which are encoded by the excursions above zero now of twice this reflecting drifted Brownian motion. So uh, the first convergence here is incurring in a sort of ordered version of L2 and the second in uh, a sequence version of the gromov hausdorff distance. But I'm not going to go into the details of that convergence here because we don't really need it for what follows. So I should say that this is joint work that I did uh, a while ago now with Luigi Dario Berry and um, Nicolas Boutin. Okay, so we understand what's going on with this forest. And indeed, we can delve slightly closer into what exactly is going on with the distribution of these trees themselves in that forest. So suppose we give ourselves the ordered sequence of excursion lengths. So then the excursions of this reflected drifting Brownian motion above zero, these are conditionally independent given their lengths, and they have a particularly nice law. So let me... Uh, so it, express this by looking at expectations of test functions or test functionals of an excursion of length s coming from this process. So then I can express it as, so this is a, a Brownian excursion of let's so say E itself is just a standard Brownian excursion. So this gives me by Brownian scaling uh, a Brownian excursion of length s. Okay, and then I need to reweight its distribution by the exponential of its area. Okay. So all this is doing is it's tilting the distribution of my Brownian excursion of length s by its area. Okay. So in particular, the R trees that are encoded by these excursions are not scaled Brownian continuum random trees, but have a law which is absolutely continuous with respect to that of a scaled Brownian continuum random tree. So me showing you Igor's picture is not so wrong in the sense that this is something that could genuinely be sampled from that measure. Okay. So let me think back to the depth first exploration that I did. So the process B lambda of T, this reflected drifting Brownian motion is describing for me the asymptotic rescaled size of the stack. Now surplus edges can go from the current vertex to any of the vertices on the stack and are just occurring independently of one another with probability P, which is about one on N. And that turns out to be the right scaling so that in the limit, surplus edges are just arising as a Poisson point process whose intensity is simply given by the rescaled size of the stack. So I've got a Poisson point process of intensity B lambda T dt on R plus. And in particular, that tells me that in each tree of my forest, I should be thinking about adding on order one surplus edges. Now the back edges are a slightly more complicated uh, question. So any large tree in this forest has size n to the two thirds in order. And so there are order n to the four thirds possible back edges, each of which is present with probability one on n. So in particular, a large tree is typically going to contain order n to the one third back edges. That's certainly not something we're going to be able to control as n goes to infinity. But fortunately, we're able to ignore the vast majority of them. So let's think now about the ancestral back edges. Those were playing a particularly important role here in that we know that they are certainly all contained in strongly connected components. So ancestral back edges can go from whatever the current vertex I'm exploring is to any of its ancestors. And so the number of those ancestors is just given by my height at time 
uh, at the time of the, the exploration that I'm making. Okay, so in particular in the limit, ancestral back edges are arising according to a Poisson point process, this time whose intensity is twice B lambda T dt on R plus. Okay, so because the height process is approximately twice the size of the stack, then what I'm seeing in the limit is a Poisson point process of intensity two B lambda T dt. So the full process of back edges which make a difference, which contribute to the strongly connected components is, a, is somewhat more complicated to describe. But let me just say that you can define a kind of continuum analog of the active set at each time. And in general, that's con consisting of a connected subtree. And the intensity of back edges is then proportional just to the total length of the active set. But importantly, that process gives rise only to finitely many back edges in any tree of the forest, rather than the potentially infinite number that we would get if we kept track of everything. So I finally want to just argue why surplus edges don't contribute. So in order for a surplus edge to matter in all of this, I need something like this picture. So here I've got a back edge, which means that this whole thing here is a strongly connected component. And then let's say we've got this surplus edge in orange present here. So then I would need something like a back edge from the subtree, which is rooted here into this strongly connected part here, or it could be a more complicated sequence of, of such pictures. So the point is that this is requiring too many low probability events to conspire with one another. So this turns out to have negligible probability in the limit simply because this subtree here is not picked in a size biased manner. I'm just picking, so it's sort of the, the, the head of this vertex doesn't in any way bias this tree. And so typically this is actually a very small part of the tree that I'm looking at. And so it has a relatively low chance to connect into any strongly connected parts that I've already generated. And so it turns out that in the limit, we can safely ignore the surplus edges and they don't make any difference. So what does this scaling limit of the strongly connected components then look like? So here's a, a particular tree in the forest where I've just picked out the strongly connected parts that it's generating or something slightly more than that. So what I've done here is I've just considered the subtree TI, which is spanned by the root and then the back edges, which go into the active set at, at the time that they're explored. Okay, so what this turns out to be is just a finite collection of branches and these extra connections. Okay, so it connects consists of finitely many directed line segments and then pairs of points to be identified. So let me emphasize this is a much simpler object than the fractal tree in which it's, inside which it sits. Okay, so in general, we're sitting inside something which looks rather like a Brownian continuum random tree. But on the other hand, we've just picked out a very finite sub part of it. Okay, and once I've done this, it becomes straightforward to extract the strongly connected components. So you can see that I've got a sort of strongly connected part over here, which turns into this object, and a strongly connected part over here that turns into this object. And this connection between them, which is just this directed edge from here to here, turns out to disappear. So that's giving me just singletons, if you think, in the sort of microscopic picture. Okay, so I guess I've got um, maybe five more minutes just to tell you about some properties of this limit object. So let me emphasize that I haven't given you at all a, a sort of explicit description of the limit object and I'm not hopeful that it's possible to do that. Um, but on the other hand, I hope you've got an idea of sort of what it looks like and how it arises. So let me just at least talk about some of its properties. So the first thing that I claimed in the theorem was that the components are either three regular or loops almost surely. So how does a loop arise? Well, if I just have a tree that contains a single ancestral back edge, then that's just giving me a loop of length, which is given by the distance between the vertex that I start from and the vertex that I end up at. Okay, so that's how a loop can simply arise just from a single uh, ancestral back edge. More complicated components, of course, require more complicated back edge structures to occur, arise. But importantly, the back edges that we use are all going to identify leaves with points of degree two. And because the underlying trees are binary with probability one, so they're absolutely continuous with respect to a Brownian continuum tree, so they're binary, the resulting strongly connected components are either going to be loops or three regular. 
because the vertices can either have two in edges and one out edge or one in edge and two, sorry, or one in edge and two out edges. Okay. So let me also uh, just talk briefly about some properties of these excursion lengths, because that's going to be useful in understanding what else can happen in this picture. So we had our ordered excursion lengths of my reflected drifting Brownian motion called sigma one, sigma two. And remember also that the excursions are conditionally independent given their length. So these lengths turn out to satisfy the following two properties. So the expectation of sigma i to the p summed over uh, the i's. So if I take the excursion lengths, raise them to the power p, sum them up and then take the expectation, that gives me a finite quantity for p bigger than three halves. But if I put in p equals three halves, then this is in fact giving me an, an almost surely infinite random variable. So these are, are not in L three halves. And that turns out to determine some of the other properties of this limit object. So let me take an excursion E tilde of my uh, drifting uh, reflected Brownian motion. And let's suppose that it has length S, so condition it to have length S. Let's then look at the numbers of ancestral and non-ancestral back edges into the active set, which are occurring in this excursion, in this subtree. So the ancestral ones are the easiest to, to, to deal with because we've just got a, a Poisson point process of ancestral back edges, which is occurring with intensity given by twice the coding function. And so in particular, the total number of ancestral back edges, which arise in one of these excursions is just given by Poisson two times its area. And we can use that to calculate with. So for example, suppose I define A to be the area under a standard Brownian excursion. So then I can compute the probability, for example, that I see no ancestral back edges. So that's going to be, I have a Poisson random variable. So the probability that Poisson random variable is equal to zero is just e to the minus its parameter. And then if I use the change of measure, which determines the distribution of E tilde, that gives me so, uh, so the, the change of measure is e to the s to the three halves times a. This is the quantity that I get under the measure change. And this is the normalizing constant. And you can see that's just giving you the ratio of the expectation of e to the minus s to the three halves times a to e to the s to the three halves times a. And that's giving you something for small s that looks like this. So notice that it's the small excursions which are which the thing that's interesting here. We want to understand the asymptotics of these quantities as the excursion lengths are getting small. And so in particular, we can obtain nice approximations to the probabilities of seeing, so zero ancestral back edges. This is the probability of seeing a single ancestral back edge and no non-ancestral back edges and similar quantities. And such calculations allow us to approximate in a useful way interesting quantities here. So in particular, there are only finitely many components which are not loops. So there are only finitely many uh, complex components here. So let me let Ki be the number of complex components coming from the ith excursion. So if I condition on the length of that excursion, sigma i, then I can bound this expectation above by probabilities involving, or probabilities and expectations involving these quantities uh, Na and Nb. And it turns out, for example, that this quantity here is on the order of the excursion length cubed. And that's a summable quantity we have then that if I sum this up over i, I'm getting that this is bounded above by a constant times the expectation of the sum of cubes of the excursion lengths, and that's something that's finite. And so in particular, we know that this is a finite random variable with probability one. And we can use a similar argument to show that there are infinitely many loops of non-zero length with probability one. So having the knowledge from the previous slide that there are finitely many complex components really just suffices to show in this context that there are infinitely many ancestral identifications. And because the probability of seeing at least one ancestral identification in an excursion of length sigma i looks like this quantity, which is varying in sigma i to the three halves. And since sigma i to the three halves is not summable, and those events occurring conditionally independently given the excursion lengths, we can deduce by the borel cantelli lemma, the second one, that the probability that we get uh, at least one ancestral back edge in an excursion for infinitely many excursions is 
So in this way, we can at least uh, understand the sort of broad scale properties of this object without really understanding its uh, distribution very well. So I just want to conclude by saying a word about universality. So just as in the case of undirected graphs, where we have now explored quite extensively the sort of universality classes that arise um, with different properties on the degree distribution, for example, these scaling limit results really shouldn't be too sensitive to the precise details of the distribution of the random directed graph. So we took the simplest random directed graph model one can, but as long as certain uh, moment conditions are fulfilled and you're looking at a critical random directed graph, you should be seeing something very similar. And two of my PhD students, Sata Dondervinkel and Zhen Eng Xu, have recently proved that the same limit holds for a directed version of the configuration model with IID random in and out degree pairs. So that's um, just been put on archive very recently. Okay, so I think that's a good place to stop. And it remains only for me to wish you joyeux anniversaire, Jean. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, are there uh, questions? Okay. Thank you, Christina, for the lovely talk. Uh, the obvious question, the, the dynamical version in Lambda, and the less obvious question, what if uh, for every dilated edge, you say, if you want to go through this edge, this cost one, but if you want to go against the flux of the edge, this cost P. So your case is P is equal to zero, but you can imagine that you make P uh, vary goes to zero with N. So you have a two parameter family with P and lambda. Can you say something about that? So uh, in answer to the second question, that's a lovely model and I haven't thought about it at all, <laughs> um, yeah. but I would be very happy to, to think about it. That, that's gorgeous. For the, for the dynamical version, yes, I think it should be possible to do something um, just as it is possible to do something in the, in the context of the undirected case. Um, I haven't thought about it and I imagine it would pose um, some interesting technical problems to do with um, uh, the topology and that sort of thing. Um, but yes, I, I would believe that there would be a, 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 directed, a, a directed version of that story um, and that, you know, possibly one can sort of go both forwards and backwards sort of by analogy with what Rafael Rossignol has done recently in the context of the, of the Edges Renew setting. So that I would believe would be possible. Your other question, I have no idea, but it, it sounds gorgeous. <laughs> Other questions? So, uh, hello, Christina. So, uh, I, I, the question of uh, Nathaniel made me think of um, of something. So, could could you use also a breadth first exploration? Would it tell something different about the model, or uh, uh, or would it be would it be essentially the same? <laughs> I mean, I guess it would give you essentially, I mean, it, it, it must give you the same object from the from the perspective of, I mean, you know, the strongly connected components are what they are. Um, I don't, I mean, you know better than anybody that in the, in the context of the undirected case, it's sort of rather harder technically to deal with the breadth first approach, although I, it would be interesting to see whether one could adapt what, what you and Sunshine did in that, in that setting. I, yeah, I haven't thought about it in any great depth, but I think it, it would be interesting to think about what, what that might give that would be different. Yeah, I, I was thinking that in the undirected case, it, it gives slightly different information about, you know, the, the radii of components and so, things like that. And, uh, you know, may, maybe in this situation, it would also allow to, to, to say something a little more about these uh, strongly connected components, but... Uh... Yes, I, I mean, I... Uh, Robin and I at various points had sort of moments of optimism and pessimism about how much it would be possible to say distributionally about these things and we sort of got stuck at some point. Um, I haven't sort of completely given up hope that it might be possible to say something, but I would expect, for example, so I, I would conjecture that these things are basically directed configuration models in law, 
I, I don't see any reason why, you know, there's so much symmetry here that there, there can't really be any reason why they shouldn't be that, but I have no way to prove that directly from our limit object at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, you, you're, uh, in the last uh, slide you mentioned the uh, perturbation of the basic model by taking random uh, IID uh, um, uh, in degrees and out degrees. In the non-directed case, there is also perturbations of taking uh, weights, things which break the symmetry in a more uh, pronounced way. Does it work? Do you expect things like that to work also in the directed case? So I, I, I expect, and indeed one of my students is working on the setting where you have the inhomogeneous version of this model, where you have a weight at each vertex and then the connections are made. So what he's going to be looking at is this rank one model where you've got a, the probability depends on the product of the weights at the endpoints, um, which is the, the case that's really been studied in, in generality in the in the in the undirected setting. So there I expect that if you have certain moment conditions on those weights, you should see the same object here, but it's really quite open what might be the other possibilities. And you would hope that there might be some sort of sort of stable settings. That's also something that one could hope to look at in the context of the configuration model. Um, so Satra and Nang Nang have looked at the setting where you've got certain moment conditions being ful fulfilled. And if you've got heavier tails, I would expect to see something else there also. So I think that there's a sort of unexplored zoo of models here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amir. Okay, other questions? So if no other questions, then let's thank Christina again. Yep.